So far, we have been informed about the perspectives and attitudes of patients in Germany. Now we are getting to be informed about German physicians and of life practices. And the speaker is Jan Schildmann. He is uh, an ethicist, medical ethicist at the University of Bochum. By training, he is a physician specialized in internal medicine. And he's one of the experts for empirical bioethics in Germany. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Hope I'm for the kind introduction and also for this invitation to the conference. As indicated in the title, I will present data of empirical research focusing on the physician's perspective in Germany. However, in a second part, I would like to give an account on what I think such research can contribute to the current debate. A debate which, at least to my perception, we can listen a number of arguments which draw on a combination of normative and empirical claims. But let me start first with a part of empirical research, and I would like to start with a research project I conducted recently mainly with my colleagues Birte Dahmen and Jochen Vollmann from the Bochum Institute for Medical Ethics and History of Medicine, in which we aimed to gather data on frequencies and characteristics of different end-of-life practices, but also focused here on views regarding assisted suicide and experiences of physicians. With regards to methods, we used a modified version of the questionnaire, which has been presented already by Agnes van der Heide. And I would like to take the occasion and thank Agnes and also Georg Bossart for the collaboration for making use of this questionnaire. I think it's important to get robust evidence on this matter. In contrast to the procedure used, for example, in the Netherlands, our starting point was not death certificates, but a random sample of physicians whom we asked about their end-of-life practices in the one patient who had most recently died. And if there were physicians in our sample who had not cared for a patient who died within the last 12 months, these physicians only asked, answered questions about their personal stances and attitudes regarding assisted suicides with a focus on their views regarding a professional law regulation. What you see here is basically the first result of our research before we even had any data. And this was the feedback we received in 2012 following our request to the 17 German state chambers of physicians for collaboration to draw a random sample of physicians. After having provided them with a detailed outline, including the rationale of the study, and one rationale was, of course, the situation that one year ago the German, the German Medical Association took up a prohibition of physician-assisted suicide in their blueprint of professional law in the Musterberufsordnung. So this was one rationale. There were only five chambers willing to draw such a sample for our study, and you see them here marked in dark areas. There were these five. There were six other chambers, and those marked in the white areas, who denied collaboration, and they gave two main reasons. One were worries regarding data protection, and you can see that this is obviously handled or estimated differently by the different chambers. However, the other group of reasons, and we have that in the letters we received, were considerable doubts regarding the content of our research and the kind of methods we use. There were also six chambers, and you can see them here shaded, who chose not to answer our letter and our reminder at all. I think this gives you a bit of an impression how difficult it was for us to set up the study. So it's not only that we are lonesome, but we also perceive considerable challenge to get this kind of data in Germany. But let's concentrate now on the results of the study, which we eventually conducted in 2013 in collaboration with five state chambers of physicians. We got a response rate of 36.9. Obviously, this is a comparable low rate to what you have seen in the countries of well-established research in this kind. And it means 
that 734 physicians completed the questionnaire. What you see also is that six out of 10 of these physicians had cared for a patient who was dying during the last 12 months, and so they could give us information about their practices at the end of life. So here you see a selection of findings, and this is true for 403 patients who had been cared by 403 physicians, and the reason why it's not 438, as shown before, is that we had a selection of those patients who were 18 years older. That was the restriction of our preliminary analysis. We wanted to get knowledge on the results. And I think the data resemble a little bit what has been mentioned already by Agnes Heide, Van der Heide, that of course the last majority of situations is decision about symptom alleviation or non-treatment decision in the sense of withholding or withdrawal of treatment. You also see 105 patients in what, which there was or in whom there was sedation till death of the patient. And you see two cases of ending of life, which is of course illegal in Germany, and there is one patient in whom there was assistance in suicide. So let's focus now on the least frequent but currently most discussed practice. In our research we could identify one case but also we could show that one in five physicians experienced requests for assisted suicide by their patients. We also wanted to know whether German physicians are prepared to provide medication for the purpose of assisted suicide and you here see yes and no to equal shares. Four of 10 could envisage a situation where they would provide a medication and four out of 10 would never do this or at least they can't imagine to do this. Being asked about the professional law situation and I said that there had been a change in 2011 and this was being taken up by several cha state chambers of physicians which actually enacted a uh, professional law prohibition of physician-assisted suicide, you see here that there's a minority of physicians who supports such kind of prohibition. It's only one in four, whereas one in third physicians reject a professional law, but you also see that there is a proportion who is undecided. So this is what I wanted to present with regards to the Bochum study, but to bolster and also to add on the presented data, I would like to briefly provide you with an insight into another survey, a survey which only came out one week ago and which was among the members of German Society of Hematology and Medical Oncology. This survey is different in many respects, but mainly it's part of an initiative of this society to raise awareness among the members of the society for this topic which is now discussed. And in light of this circumstance, the initiative started, I think, in the beginning of the year, we had little time for the survey. And of course, that means that we had to make methodical compromises. We didn't have the opportunity to use an extensive pretest in this kind of survey. Still, given the lack of data on the topic of assisted suicide, I think it was still warranted that we got involved in this kind of research and what we got was that within seven days, only seven days, that electronic survey was available. A quarter of the members of this society with a valid email address responded and filled out a short questionnaire. And I can say that it was mostly very experienced clinicians with 10 or more years experience in oncological practice and also four out of 10 had an additional qualification in palliative medicine, so they had the so-called Zusatzbezeichnung für Palliative Medizin. What you can see here, and I'm sorry that I couldn't translate everything, it was just too short now the time, is the response with regards to the question whether they have been requested to perform assisted suicide, and half of the respondents say they never came across such situation. You also see that about 43%, 330, had been asked by patients whether in principle they would assist in suicide. 
And furthermore, one in eight, so in total 99, have been asked in concrete terms whether they would prescribe a medication. With regards to the actual practice, 22 of the oncologists reported that they had performed. Seven of them said that they had been qualified in palliative medicine, having the Zusatzbezeichnung für Palliative Medizin. And what you can see here is different modes of assistance. So 15 said they provided information, eight said that we prescribed the medication, and nine mentioned other form of assistance, and of course, different oncologists used several modes, so you have more than the 22. Finally, we used two questions of the Bochum study to elicit oncologist preparedness to assist with suicide. So it's the same wording, basically, which we have used in the first study presented. And what you see here is that 57 of the oncologists could not imagine to provide medication for the purpose of assisted suicide, whereas one third could imagine that. And the picture changes when they are asked about their view on the professional law. You may know that at the moment, 10 of 17 state chambers of physicians have implemented now a professional law prohibition regarding assisted suicide. And this is supported by a minority. You see 41% in this sample. A third rejects it, and one in five is undecided. So much for the data, and I think we can say two things about the current situation of empirical research on end-of-life practice in general and assisted suicide in particular in Germany. The one thing has been mentioned, there is a scarcity with regards to high quality data in this field. The situation can't be compared to the situation we have heard this morning about the Netherlands or Oregon. We are far away from that. On the other hand, I think it's also fair to say that we have some hints, some indicator that the data we gathered are not completely detached from what is going on in real life. There's some replication of the data in research, which I couldn't present today, and also the fit more or less in what we have in a picture from the international debate. As indicated in the beginning, I would like now to move on from the, let's say, empirical state of affairs and use the last minutes of my presentation for reflection on what such data may contribute to the ethical or maybe ethical legal and also political debate. So by ethical debate, I mean that in the broad terms as ethical considerations very much oriented towards practice. And here let me first mention two challenges, which I perceive when combining empirical data and ethical argumentation. And the first is implicit normativity in empirical research. To my experience, such implicit normativity, for example, sneaks into the formulation of questions in empirical research. And it's not only the public opinion polls, it's actually unavoidable that there is some normativity in some concepts we have with regards for a good death, for example. But also, of course, the way we select, we present, we discuss our data is certainly somehow framed on our stance, on our normative stance. And I think we cannot avoid it. It's nothing bad. We may be transparent about it, and we may improve the situation by interdisciplinary research involving researchers from empirical and normative science. A second point I would like to stress is that at least in the scientific debate, we should be explicit on the role of empirical research in the current debate. There are many different positions here. For example, we could hold the position that if we reconstruct the morality of a certain practice by qualitative studies, by interviewing different stakeholders, then we could come more or less directly to a kind of normative position regarding assisted suicide. I'm not a proponent of this position. I'm more inclined to the view that we need this kind of data, but it doesn't make a direct inference to the normative claim I have with regards to assisted suicide. So then, of course, the question is what the data can contribute to the current debate. And I would like to conclude with two examples based on what I have presented in terms of empirical data. 
Firstly, I think research on practices, may that be from the perspective of physicians or also from patients, and we also heard the perspectives of uh, relatives, I think it's helpful in that it establishes the case and also characterizes the group of patients and the situations in which past physician-assisted suicide is requested and maybe sometimes performed. And I think such knowledge is important to specify a normative framework, for example, a law or professional law, to get a match, if you want, between the facts, the morally relevant facts we can find in the practice and what you want to regulate, the normative categories. And I think with regards to what we know about the characteristics of the patients or the situation, it's safe to say that also in Germany, we have this small group of patients who request earnestly assisted suicide, and even in a smaller number, they perform it. And it's important, it's not a fiction, because sometimes you have the impression, even when talking with people from practice, that because they haven't experienced such a situation, that it's not there. But I think that's a contribution of this research. It is there, even though it's a very small, and maybe also a very heterogeneous group. Another finding in this respect is, I think, that we have evidence and not only with regards to Germany, but also we heard from other countries, that assisted suicide also occurs in the presence of qualified physicians in palliative medicine. So the idea that you can prevent this phenomenon by putting more resources in palliative care, I think is not correct. The second type of contribution of data I would like to point out here is that I think by providing information about practices and views, such studies can contribute to a transfer and generate basically a debate with regards to what should be, for example, on a professional law, uh, level. And I would say that the data with regards to the views of physicians, the experiences, the heterogeneity of that, there's a quite a big potential of debate among German physicians. This is first of all because we have this kind of very conflicting positions within the group of German physicians. But also, it became clear from our research that there is a contrast between what physicians think about an appropriate professional law regulation and what the representatives of the German Medical Association or also those who made the professional law in the 10 of the 17 state chambers do think. There is a tension here, and I think that has been made transparent. Of course, one can deny this kind of tension and instead prefer to set up a press conference, as this has been done in December 2014 by the presidents of the state chambers of physicians, and just issue a statement which pretends or presses or whatever you want to call it on the unity of German physicians in this matter. It's one reaction you can choose. I would say, at least if you take into account the data we have, and if we believe that deliberation and discourse also among the German physicians is a source for wisdom to generate an appropriate professional law framework, we should take some time and find an appropriate process to seek such kind of framework. A framework which obviously needs to take into account the different positions, the different experience physicians have with regards to assisted suicide. It would be necessary to have a kind of forum which enables physicians to articulate the reasons for their different stances, for their differing positions. And I know, I acknowledge that this is a challenging task. I think it's not a task which can be done, for example, in a late afternoon session at the Deutsche Ärztetag, the assembly of the German Medical Association, where at the end of a some hour uh, discussion you have a kind of poll and then make a decision on professional law. I think that's too easy. However, given that physicians have this privilege to construe their normative professional ethics and professional law framework, I think they are responsible to look for this kind of forum, this kind of appropriate process for considerate decision making. And if they do, I could imagine that the whole debate we currently have with regards to legislation, the need for law, could appear in a very different light. Thank you very much. Thank you for giving us this.
empirical data. Thank you for informing us about the plurality among physicians and thank you for the considerations how to use these data. There is time for questions. Please. I would like you to ask, uh, what do you think uh, should be derived from your data concerning the willingness of physicians to assist in suicide, concerning the aim of the politicians to make a law with only uh, allowing physician assisted suicide in Germany. I think the experiences from the Netherlands um, show that uh, the restriction only to um, allow physician assisted suicide uh, would prevent people s uh, from uh, getting it and would leave them to suffering. Thanks for this. I mean even within this statement, there were so many hypotheses and also empirical premises that I just can say from the data I have presented today, I can't give you a comment on that. Sorry about this. I, I do have an opinion, but it's not related to what I present, so I would like to refrain from this, also because of the methodological consideration. Thanks. Any further question? I know you are hungry. <laughs> Okay, if that's not the case, then uh, we are at the end of our morning session, our English session, the afternoon will be in Germany. We now have a lunch break, you are invited for lunch around here. Those who want to attend the press conference, it takes place in a room at the end of this hall. And we will see us at 2 o'clock here. Guten Appetit. <laughs>